Hello and welcome to episode four in Chess's video series around the 10 steps to cybersecurity. In a change to our advertised program, we're going to be talking about vulnerability management in this session. Um, and I'd like to introduce David Dixon and Andrew Walker, um, and I'll let them give a quick introduction to themselves. Hi, uh, my name is David Dixon. I'm the security testing pre-sales consultant for Armadillo Security with Chess. Hi, my name is Andrew Walker. I'm the digital enterprise director for um, the enterprise team. And I'm sure I need no introduction, um, Adam Gleason, Cybersecurity Vendor Alliance Manager here at Chess. So guys, why do we need vulnerability management first of all? So periodically software needs updating, doesn't it? And what are the reasons for this? Well, I think there's, I suppose it's always, it always goes back to the, the old adage of, you know, things improve over time, vulnerabilities are found. And it's not, I suppose, from David's point of view, it's not just vulnerabilities from a security perspective. There's a lot of time you have um, bugs in software. Thankfully, it's a lot better these days than it is in the past, but you will get bugs in the software that will require you know, fundamental changes to stop errors occurring. And, and, and that's kind of a, the driver of everything. But that's at the heart, it's about improving customer experience as well. Um, vulnerabilities come in terms of even, um, I suppose, legislation in terms of regard to Adam, in terms of the things that you used to be able to do, you're not be able to do anymore. And from that, changes to the software have to have to be applied. And obviously, as we talk about software, we talk about it at a very high level in terms of in, in, in terms of the tools that you use, but also, I suppose, in terms of the um, the platforms that sit on as well, because that, that is the key piece, whether it be laptops, desktops, servers or whatever. So you, you touched upon, um, you, you mentioned the word sort of vulnerability and security in the same sentence there. David, could you elaborate and just sort of, you know, what, what are these sorts of things? What are we talking about when we talk around vulnerabilities in software? I mean, it, the, the vulnerabilities can cover quite a broad, um, a broad spectrum of uh, what we call sort of technical security vulnerabilities within applications. And these can be anything from the, the application front end or the, or the UI uh, or applications that might exist within the, uh, the APIs that are connected to the application um, or even as far as, uh, as the back end as well. Um, and basically what, what, um, what we're looking at when we're conducting penetration tests are uh, any vulnerabilities that are recognized within the OWASP top 10. So this is a, a routinely updated, um, uh, globally recognized list of the most common top 10 vulnerabilities that exist in open web applications. So first and foremost, we're always checking for those things, but they could be as simple, they could be as something as simple as uh, weak passwords. That's something that even today we still find as being one of the top common vulnerabilities. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it could just be something as simple as um, outdated certificates. Uh, and again, this is where it's crucial for... They're really obvious things, right? Really yeah. obvious, basic things, but that people are doing quite that. often that's what gets forgotten about the most. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you've got broader, um, more sort of technical um, uh, attack vectors like SQL injection and so on, which, you know, any application that has a simple search form, if it's built, you know, using something like SQL databases, then it's uh, it's going to potentially present a risk around uh, those kind of injections. And these these vulnerabilities are, are in essence, security flaws. And what yeah. what do these security flaws, what does that actually mean? So, you know, the, you know we've, we've got an unpatched version of something running on there yeah. with a security flaw in it. What what does that actually mean? So that basically means that if something's not being patched and up to date, it's, it's not being currently supported. Um, and basically that's something that hackers are, uh, are very much aware of and they're gonna be looking for as, you know, kind of low hanging fruit as a as a way in to gain the unauthorized access that they're, that they're looking for, and so so they can they can leverage these things to actually gain a level of access to the to the system. Absolutely, and, and not all cases does it mean that they're guaranteed to be successful. You know, obviously, um, network security comes with layers, yeah. but um, first and foremost, from an external layer, that's what they're going to be looking for to exploit. And hackers are always looking for the path of least resistance. Okay, okay, thanks, thanks. So. Let's let's. So we, we've talked around why we need to update. What happens if we don't do updates? Um, so I mean, to, to my mind, we're we're kind of leaving the back door to the organisation wide open because it, it these security flaws offer someone a really easy way of getting into the environment. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, exactly that. Um, it's it's an easy back door into the environment, and for uh, stakeholders within any organisation that might not be security focused or 
um, security experts, they might not even be aware that those vulnerabilities are even present, which is why it's crucial to keep on top of your vulnerability yeah. management in the first place. And, and also, um, from what Andy said, said before, it could be a, a regulatory or a compliance issue whereby um, if, for example, you're working within the public sector, if you have any unpatched um, uh, technology services or applications even that are connected to, uh, say, a public sector network, then that will immediately mean on compliance and you know, can have huge implications for that organisation. And, it is, and I think it's fair, fair to say, David, you, these days the challenge is also in the fact that you patch as long as the patch exists. Yeah. And I think this is where a lot of the time, Adam, we get, we get a lot of conversations around legacy of systems and that, that whole concept of people are aware that this is might be a business critical system or, or potentially not, but it helps yeah. the process but it's sitting on older kit that no longer is patched. And that, that does become a major issue moving forward yeah. as well. Um, one of the points that, that I wanted to sort of talk about here without updates, because it, it's coming up increasingly in conversations that I have with customers, is around the cyber insurance premiums. And of course, you know, if the insurance companies are all the time updating their terms and stuff like that to make sure that they're protecting themselves to a degree, you know, they're business entities at the end of the day, and, and they're protecting themselves against customers who, who are simply not taking cybersecurity seriously. And um, what's the sort of the effect that these sorts of things have on cyber insurance premium? Well, I mean, this, the way to look at a cyber insurance premium these days is to potentially what it was five, six years ago, when it was just count the number of machines and we'll give you a price. Yeah. The way to look at it now is it's it's about taking care of yourself. It's it's like a health insurance policy these days. The more you can show that you go at the gym, the more that you've got a Fitbit or, or an Apple Watch that's giving you an indication of your health, right. the cheaper it gets. The real danger now becomes that where it's been a you're paying a higher premium because potentially you're, you're, you're not maybe as secure as you should be. The real danger point now is not about the price. The danger point now becomes the small print that says you willingly, you willingly haven't gone forward on this and the risk is that your cyber insurance policy isn't actually valid at all. Right, okay. I hadn't even thought of that. That's yeah. And, and it's, it's also no longer, uh, sorry, no longer now appropriate to have sort of reactive measures or be able to demonstrate um, that you can respond to, to threats that will sort of keep those premiums down. It used to be a few years ago that you need to be able to demonstrate that you had an adequate instant response plan or provided. It was a lot simpler, wasn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Now yeah. insurance providers are asking, um, uh, to Andy's point, you know, how how much care are you taking uh, taking of your own estate? Um, and you need to be able to demonstrate much more proactive measures. So doing routine pen test, uh, penetration testing, doing routine vulnerability management, um, having other capabilities that can detect, you know, threats before before they become a real problem um, as, as a way of being able to demonstrate that you're taking cybersecurity seriously. And and without doing software updates, is the likelihood of data breaches, the risk of having your data breached, is that is that going to be higher? I suppose that it, you know, it follows that it will. Invariably, invariably, what you get is a point where your risk portfolio expands. Mm. And you know, to take a point about the cyber insurance even further, it's no longer just about how, how you behave within your environment. It's now becoming a question where you're going out and you're asking your suppliers or people that you yeah. work with, what's your security policy? Yes. And that yeah. and that layers in as well now. So it's not just about whether they have cyber insurance, whether they have a security policy. It's about their patch management. Yeah. It's, it's about their systems. And that's a slightly more difficult scenario to get to because obviously you don't want to be um, sharing business critical estates, but you want to be able to demonstrate that the, the, the people that you're working with as well um, have the appropriate policies in play, fundamentally because we never like to use the word, but contagion is real. You can you can start somewhere and it can end somewhere completely different. With regards to vulnerability management, we're not only looking at the the, the things that the, the vulnerabilities that may be present in our environment, but we need to be patching these things. And the implications of not doing this is one that we're leaving the back door open to the organisation. Um, software might perform unpredictably. You touched upon that at the start of the at the start of the chat. Um, our cyber insurance premiums are increasing all of the time as you know insurance companies become a bit more savvy and they're looking to protect their own investments and them and their own businesses. And then of course we've got the risk of data breaches, which again could pass on cost uh, cost to the customer or to to whoever um, from regulatory fines and things like that. Okay, so. We've talked around vulnerability management and why we need it and stuff like that. 
what does vulnerability management actually need? So what are the sort of processes that, that we need to be sort of going through here? So uh, there's a few different approaches that any organization can take. It just really depends on their level of maturity, knowledge, expertise, and capabilities, really. So um, I'm sure any organization that's large enough to have their own internal IT security team will be familiar with uh, scanning tools like Nessus. Yeah. That's probably kind of the gold standard um, when you think of vulnerability scanning, particularly automated uh, vulnerability scans and usually these supplement um, uh, providing levels of assurance to an organization between say annual pen tests which um, uh, an annual pen test is a much more thorough manual um, uh, assessment of you know whatever it is you're more of a, it's system. more of a human-led exercise exactly. as opposed to something yeah. that just runs automatically and uh, the caveat with vulnerability uh, management is that uh, that doesn't also supplement pen testing either because quite often what you have on the uh, the back end of a pen test is like you say you know a human-led uh, a consult a consultative approach you can um, help interpret and uh, report on those vulnerabilities and provide strategic recommendations yeah, now um, in terms of the different ways of approaching regular vulnerability management um, there's uh, self-service options where, you know, say, take a tool like Nessus and use it in-house yourself. Um, that, that would be beneficial if, like I said before, you have the, uh, the resources and expertise to be able to understand what that scan is yeah. providing. Um, quite often, automated uh, scanning tools, they, can tend, uh, they tend to churn out a few false positives. So sometimes it can be, you know, trying to uh, separate the chaff from the wheat in terms of finding out what, what are real vulnerabilities and, you know, what are false. Uh, the beneficial with having, say, a, a managed vulnerability scanning service or, say, a, a semi-automated vulnerability scan is that you've still got a... Uh, a human on the other end who's basically helping uh, to make sense Fil of that report. Filter some of that. Filter some of those positive Reduce the out. noise. Sort of. Exactly. So all that's being provided to, to the customer um, on the other end is a report that they can make sense of and they know where those vulnerabilities are and how, how best to remediate them. Um, so, there, so there's sort of a few different approaches you can take with uh, with routine vulnerability management. But the, the key takeaway, I would say, is that um, it's something that helps any organization keep on top of uh, any changes, any patches, um, any any new hidden vulnerabilities that might come about from any changes made to those applications or systems in between doing annual pen tests. Um, an annual pen test is ultimately just a snapshot in time. Yeah. But doing, say, monthly or even quarterly vulnerability scans across your you know your estate can help you keep on top of those um, of those vulnerabilities in the meantime. But, but you made you made a good point about the tool. Yeah. I mean, I, I come from an ICT era where it wouldn't be unknown for the head engineer or the senior engineer within an internal team to literally be patching when required as a manual yeah. process. Yeah. And that just cannot happen now in terms of the way that we, the, the organization works. We are a, a sort of arms race here. Vulnerabilities come out on a very regular Absolutely. basis and the, they need to be patched. And any any system now, it's about, it's about the right tool for the right job. Yeah. Also, I suppose it's it's about the attitude to risk, I suppose. The, the, there's an element there between an organization where um, the key thing is to know the estate. Yeah. And the problem sometimes occurs that you have that degree of, in businesses where there's a small IT team or in some cases no IT team at all, a shadow IT comes into play where yeah. you need something to do a particular job, you can't get it, you have the ability to download on your machine, yeah. you think it's the right the right tool for the right job, it's usually free, that's the, always a driver. And you may accidentally include something, potentially not that's harmful, and I know, I'm, I obviously have this conversation a lot with people, it may not necessarily be harmful, but it's going to hand some data back to an organization that might want to suddenly start marketing to you in a way yes. that you don't want to be marketed. And, yeah. and like everything is, it, you know, you, you, want to, you want to reduce that incoming flow of traffic the best you can because you don't want to have volume create mistakes in terms of, you know, missing things. And again, it's all that, that whole process, but the knowledge of the estate is, is critical to it. And that's why tools are... Maybe, it, understanding it the scope of what it is that you're actually managing and, yeah. and being able to... And, and <clears throat> you, you mentioned a key area there about, about risk. Um, and risk often, you know, it's, it's easy to put solutions in. I say easy, it's very expensive, but it's easy to put solutions in that will do everything for you. But there needs to be a trade-off between what is a, an acceptable level of risk versus what is actually an affordable solution. Um, and that, that's something that I think we'll probably talk about more in the future as a separate session because it's, it's quite, quite a big topic that we can cover off there. Um, and, and, you know, furthermore, there's, there's some really easy areas of risk that we can remove by removing, you touched upon unsupported hardware and stuff like that. You know, there's, you, we still come across it every now and then that there's some stuff that, that's sat there and it's, 
you can't really emphasize it enough that if it's an unsupported operating system, if it's unsupported hardware, then these things are no longer receiving security updates. And if anyone releases anything like the Eternal Blue um, tool that the NSA released accidentally or purposefully, whatever you want to believe, um, these things were extremely damaging and, and extremely powerful in the wrong hands. Um, and, you know, and, and unsupported operating systems, hardware and or applications don't really stand a chance against them. No. No, I mean, you only have to look at, I think it was the NotPetya attack in, I think it was 2017, that yes. pretty much knocked almost all of NHS's uh, yeah. uh, windows off, offline. Well, well WannaCry is the, the common the name for it, it isn't it? Right, yeah. one, yeah. And, um, and that was simply because they were running, you know, a myriad of unsupported systems yeah. you know, in, on, on Windows XP. And it's often not necessarily through, you know, negligence or, or, or lethargy that these things, it's because they're, they're stuck with these particular systems and these systems are, or that they're, they're, you know, the bread and butter of what they do requires certain applications and that application won't run on newer systems. And it's, it's really around that, you know, enough's enough. They have to take a stand and sort of say, you know, we've got to move away from these things or you need to radically increase the security and implement security solutions that are going to compartmentalize these things and make sure that, all right, the system is not secure, but we can make sure that it's not visible anywhere except to the, the, the areas of the business that absolutely need it. Absolutely. There are challenges to it. And again, really, David touched upon it earlier in some regard about user error in some in yeah. some regards. Sometimes, and again, it's about... It's about having the ability to have time to do things. And I think one of the things that we try and build with some of the security part tools that we provide is, is we're buying people time to, to, to do maybe the other job yeah. that they need to do. And one of, the, one of the things that we noted, again, it was very much a case of, you know, we, we talk about human frailties. And sometimes it is that ability not to log anything, not back up anything, yeah. not to yeah. document. And document is critical, I think. Or intend to do it and never get around. Well, I mean, I, I, I think I think yeah. my very first job in IT, I, I went out to, a, it was a paper mill, in a paper mill that made paper for um, cigarettes. Andrew, you're letting them know how old you are now. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's okay, because people still think I'm your, I'm your slightly younger and slightly more attractive brother. Wow. But anyway, let's, let's not start that argument. Yeah. Again. <laughs> okay. but, that, but that's the fundamental process. You go in a, you go in a lab. Yep. It has all manner of machines connected up. Each, each machine has got a testing environment to it, and it puts information into an access database as to how old. And um, that was great, and they wanted to modernise it, and they wanted the whole thing. And, of course, the first question was, who built it? And sadly, that individual had passed away. Yep. And there was no documentation, and there was no password information, and there was no what does actually do. They knew it worked. But what they didn't know is they didn't know how to actually then maintain it, so they never switched the damn stuff off. Yeah, that's the danger point we have with human frailty. Okay, so so we've, again, we've talked about there's, there's a lot to this, um, but in short, vulnerability vulnerability management means that it's it's one, it's about having visibility, visibility, and and an understanding of the scope of what it is that you need to protect, and then being able to accurately understand where the vulnerabilities lie within that. But then that's only half of the problem. We, we then need to be able to, to, to do action on that and make sure that we're addressing those vulnerabilities or as necessary where, where we can't do any direct action to actually remove the vulnerability, we mitigate the risk that it presents to the business. Okay, so, so moving on to how do we actually do vulnerability management? So in the, you know, previously we've talked about understanding the scope and understanding access to your environment. So how does that, where, where do we actually start with that? It's, it's, a, good, it's a good question. There's, it's like a cornucopia, I suppose, of where we go first. I think it's the data. It has to be the data. The crown jewels, as well, we, we say these days. We, we've come, we, we, we now live in an era where the considered wisdom seems to be that, that data is worth more than oil in yeah. terms of that. But I think it depends what the oil price is at the time. <laughs> but the fundamentals are still the same. It's what people are looking for. It's a tradable commodity. Absolutely. And I think this you know, ties in a little bit with you know, what I mentioned earlier with the shadow IT aspect. It's about knowing the estate. It's about knowing how you interact with that estate. It's knowing about how you move data around. We, we, we do a lot these days, um, again, about process and behavior. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, 10 years ago, I don't think I would ever mention to any client about the concept of, well, I see what you're trying to do here. Um, let's make the product work to what you want to do. Now we talk about it in terms of products in the cloud, the products I'm going to give you all these processes that you want automatically. However, it's not maybe do that 15% that you do. Let's have a conversation, but can we improve the yeah. nature of it? I mean, one of the one of the scenarios that we talk an awful lot about the customers about is it's about utilizing things like, you know, you know, you know, 365 stack to just send links 
Yeah. Please don't send attachments of data to people. Yeah. Yeah. It's a not, uh, such a common feature to automatically just take data, put in a, a, an Excel spreadsheet. And very much on legacy systems where you actually can't access the yeah. data. So maybe one of the one of the fixes to it is, I've got an idea, we'll shut down the system, we'll access, we'll extract the data from it, and then we'll present it, but then you're presenting in a slightly unsafe way. Yeah. That's the piece about what you want to look at in, in, in theory. It's about where is the data, is it can is it in a contained environment, a controlled environment, yeah. and and even more importantly, in an auditable environment? Yes. We're very much yeah. these days about being able. I think you talked about it earlier, David, and we've, we've talked about the cyber before about the front door, and we're very much about locking the yeah. front door and making sure people can't get through that. But poor practice behind the scenes can lead to as much data loss as, 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 as anything else. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just just to um, just to piggyback off, off that point, actually, I mean, there's, there's three kind of key areas that um, you should look at when talking about cybersecurity strategy, and that's people, processes, and technology. And I think all too often people only focus and get tunnel vision on the, the technology part. Yeah. And really, you know, as we've seen, uh, you know, all over the news from previous hacks, it's it's all too common is it takes one person to click on a phishing email link Absolutely. that they shouldn't. Um, and also as well, we mentioned it before, but um, having inadequate policies and processes in place yeah. like weak passwords um, or um, having inadequate um policies around identity access management, you know, who can access that data. It's all well and good knowing where that data is uh, and, and uh, being able to lock it down. But it's um, it's quite often, you know, we're, we're so focused on keeping the bad guys out externally that we're, we're not paying an, enough attention to um, that data being accidentally leaked yeah. or shared somewhere, you know, shared with it. I'm going to stop you there because we'll start wondering we're going to steal our own thunder from a future session. But you're exactly, you're, you're absolutely right about, about the identity and access management. So, it's about taking action and building automation into this thing. Automation, we've touched upon this several times. In a very small organization, maybe this is manageable for someone to do. Yeah. But as we talked about, these things are coming out so thick and fast now. Yeah. It, you're gonna be paying someone who's constantly just gonna be sat there doing, doing deployment. So yeah. how can we fix that problem? How can we address that need? I think, I think the, 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 the two, two sets very, very important that you use. Um, we, I'm gonna take the two set we use, but we always look in terms of a friendly process, something that's very, very much a user-based system that the interface is intuitive. It lets people do things in a very simple manner. I mean, again, one of the things that we look at, you know, as part of you know our engagements is that whole process of the skill levels of the individuals within yeah. the organization. What you always want to put in front of someone is options where, you know, the client's got some options, sometimes around price. But a lot of the time, it's about the training aspect. It's yeah. about making sure that the tools that we do use that automate that patching process, that automate, you know, when people leave an organisation. Again, how have you used your Active Directory? We want to talk about Active Directory with clients now in terms of using it as a group policy rather than individual policy. That's certainly in the SharePoint world, but certainly that's that's the thing that we would do in terms of the, the, the automation. I think absolutely. You know. Yeah, and, and, and beyond that, um, it's uh, just about having automated vulnerability capabilities that can keep on top of um, a, a much larger estate than, like you mentioned, you know, than a, a smaller organization might have to yeah. worry about. Um, so if you can do uh, estate-wide vulnerability scans across, you know, however many subnets that you might have, then um, being able to keep on top of that routinely, um, it's just going to make the organization or, you know, whoever is responsible for it within that organization much more familiar with that. And, and I suppose having that, you know, having the... the the, the, that automation so that it, you know, with, with simple reports that give you exactly. just what you need, yeah. really executive summary type reports. I think, uh, it's, I think it's also fair to say, just, just touching on that point, even more so for organizations who acquire. Yes. Who, who make Absolutely. acquisitions. Yeah. Because acquisitions happen a number of ways, but what you want is you want seamless process. Yeah. You want to, you want to bring these organizations in to, to the way you work, and also at the same time, the reality of it is they may have different they may have different systems. Larger organisations who acquire are likely to have better systems than the ones that are that Absolutely. are playing. Yeah. Um, one thing that we didn't touch upon is is we use the vulnerability assessments and stuff like that to identify the vulnerabilities in the first place. Yeah. It's not so much of a problem now, but it, in in years gone by, I have seen it where. Patches of, of a vulnerability has been identified, patch has been deployed, and then you rerun the vulnerability scan to make sure that the vulnerability has been remediated, but but it hasn't. So 
my point being is that we should be running these things before we patch, but then we should also be following it up Absolutely. after patching to make sure that, you know, we run the vulnerability scan on a Monday, we patch Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, depending on, on how we're going to scale that. Yeah. And then we do another vulnerability scan on a Friday and we make sure that there's, there's a differential between the two that, that the, 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 the things identified previously. If you take an application, for example, um, that, or, you know, a server or whatever piece of technology it is that you're conducting the scan over, um, once you make changes, you know, even through patches, it's a different it's a different environment to yeah. what you, to what you uh, scanned yeah. previously. Um, it's like with penetration testing; you know, it's always advisable to do follow up with a retest to make sure that any vulnerabilities that were found in the initial testing have been appropriately re yeah. remediated. Yeah. Um, because if they uh, if they haven't, and there have been any slight changes or created even new vulnerabilities, then um, then effectively you're still you're still leaving a potential gap open there for for attackers to get in. Same applies with vulnerability management. If it's going to be different. So at the time that you conducted that scan, then you should be doing it again for the same yeah. reasons. Excellent. Thanks, guys. And I think that's probably about we've run out of time. Um, so really, to, to sum up, vulnerability management is something that everyone needs to be doing in, in, in IT today, in all organizations. Um, it's about understanding what the scope of your environment is and making sure that you, you've got a clear identified scope. You then need to be keeping an eye on that and monitoring it and understanding what vulnerabilities are present. You then need to be remediating those vulnerabilities in a way that's practical that you know is and, and, and as efficient as you can make it. And then you need to be double checking on those things and making sure that the vulnerabilities and the remediations that you've put in place um, have actually been effective. That's it from us. Um, see you next time and stay secure.